now we're going to have our second segment of World Crisis Radio. Uh, things are a little bit uh, unsettled because we are on the road here and uh, using not the usual equipment. All right. So um, those two themes. Right? Yeah, a big defeat for imperialism it gets us into the Russian question. And then, of course, uh, th this issue of the mass strike, which has taken to forms that are perhaps unexpected. But we're still on track. 2015, I think, is, a, is a, still a, a very good uh, estimate of where this is going to happen. The other thing that we have to mention is this question of um, how insane the U.S. ruling class is, right? How bonkers they are. How, how have they lost their moorings, right? How they are absolutely incapable of being realists uh, and, and understanding the the world, and, and part of it is that over the past 25 years, all of these figures, right, be it Kerry, be it Samantha Power, be it Victoria Newland, be it this guy Piat, be it Obama, of course, and his entire crew there in the, in the White House, Susan Rice, and so forth, they've all bought into this doctrine of the end of history, and you'll remember what this was. Uh, I urge you to take a look at... Um, my uh, Bush biography, right? George Bush, the unauthorized biography, 1992. And uh, in here, you will find this question of the, the end of history. Francis Fukuyama, neocon academic, emerged as the house ideologue of the Bush administration. And he was able to do this uh, with an essay called The End of History. Now, The End of History, my thesis is that that, that phase is over. History did not end. History stalled, if you will, for a while. And this was this period of unipolar U.S. domination, which has been a failure. It's been bad for the U.S. It's brought out the worst of the U.S. ruling class. It has allowed the rise of Creatures such as the neocons, who under normal uh, conditions just wouldn't be tolerated right, by by voters, they would not be able to present themselves in public with their, uh, their you know their demand for uh, for war. And then the, the people understood that war is a two way street; they would not propose it so lightly. Right? I guess John McCain is the clearest example of this. I'm just trying to find it. Let's see if I can find you the, uh, these interesting quotes that are in the, uh, in the, uh, Bush, uh, biography. Here we go. Fukuyama. Fukuyama wrote in, um, 1990, 1991, as the Soviet Union was collapsing, the triumph of the Western political idea, one idea, is complete. Its rivals have been routed. Political theory, at least the part concerned with defining the good polity, is finished. Political theory is over. The Western idea of governance has prevailed. What we may be witnessing is not just the end of the Cold War or the passing of a particular period of post-war history, but the end of history as such. The end of history as such, that is, the end point of mankind's ideological evolution and the universalization of Western liberal democracy as the final form of human government. The modern American state, and this means the degraded thrall of financiers, zombie bankers, and assorted predators, that's what he means, the modern American state, not the New Deal state, but this other one, the modern one that he likes, is the final rational form of society and state. <laughs> that was Fukuyama. That was the ideology of Bush 41, and that's pretty much where the, the foundations of globalization and unipolarity were, were laid. Um, and this is what all of these imperialist bureaucrats believe they have built their careers on this, right? They believe that these this arrogance, right, this this radically anti historical way 
of looking at the world. It couldn't be more radically historical than anti-historical than to say we're we're now living in the end of history as such. Whoa, the end point. I think it'll make a point. It has mystical, crazy uh, overtones. Uh, this is what this is what's going on in all their heads. And also, you know, we we have these other quotes from from Jessica uh, Matthews in the power shift essay from the uh, Foreign Affairs, right, that the post-1648 system of uh, states, of nation-states, that's over, and instead what we're going to have from now on is the rule of non-governmental organizations, NGOs, and international hot money, and, uh, you know, instant communications. And remember, this is Jessica Matthews, who wants one NATO division on the ground in Ukraine, composed of one U.S. brigade and then four, five, six battalions from other NATO states. Add it up, it makes two brigades, two brigades make a division, and there you have it. Uh, so these people are nuts, and that's one of our one of our biggest problems. But now, the news of this past year, and I think beyond anything else, is the idea that history has... History has reasserted itself. We're not living in the end of history. History is not over. At most, you could say it momentarily stalled, and now it is revving up once again. Uh, there is a definite challenge to this entire unipolar system, and that goes for the geopolitical side, where we see Putin acting. <laughs> I mean, we could follow this into the to land of Hegel, right? You could say, well, he's acting as the embodiment of the the uh, world system, right? The best guy is, is coming on the scene, right? And notoriously, when Hegel saw Napoleon in Jena around the time of that battle in the Napoleonic Wars, Hegel wrote, I just saw the Weltgeist ride into town on a horse. Well, uh, you can see Weltgeist Putin talking on the, on the radio, but of course, it's a mystification. It's a nice metaphor. Sounds trendy, but... Uh, it's all, it's all a, a, a matter of, of uh, you know, the policy of a government. The thing that we need, and what we may, we may be about to get, given the way things are going in Ukraine, is this question of the economic globalization. And the Glazyev proposals, right, which remain on the table, Sergei Glazyev and his idea that it's time to... De-dollarize, right? Exclude the dollar, use the ruble, and that's for the huge amounts of energy that they sell. And uh, time to have the central bank provide cheap long-term credit. And we'll be back in a minute on World Crisis Radio in New York City here for the uh, the Left Forum. So, uh, with Glazyev, what's the idea? Use the ruble, not the dollar, in foreign trade. He's ready to sell off U.S. securities. It's about half a trillion. That will stir the market to some degree. He's also ready to default on dollar loans. Look, he says, if you don't let me earn dollars, then I won't have any and I can't pay. And that's uh, two tough, tough uh, lines for you. But above all, two things. Capital and exchange controls that banks would have to justify and uh, essentially get permission implicitly from the VED bank and other Russian banks in order to be able to send money overseas. That's one thing. And, of course, it would mean that you would not be able to organize a panic run on the ruble or the GKO, Russian state bonds, if that's what they're called still today. Uh, you would not be able to organize that kind of a panic run because you'd have capital and exchange controls in place. This is It builds on the Mahathir Mohammed experience of uh, 1998 Malaysia and set a piece of the whole thing. If Russian companies can't get bank credit from Europe or the U.S. because of sanctions, then the Russian Central Bank will be directed to come in and replace that, those loans with long-term low-interest ruble loans from the Russian Central Bank through the VEB Bank. <laughs> now, uh, it's the Siloviki, the power ministers against the neoliberals and the oligarchs. That's Moscow right now. 
And remember, the uh, liberals, the neoliberals are a powerful faction. They're led by Medvedev, <laughs> needless to say. German Graf, the Minister of Economic uh, Development and Trade. Uh, Alexei Kudrin, the former Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister. Anton Silovanov, neoliberal. This is a, a little uh, vignette from a, uh, a meeting of the Russian cabinet in the evening of April 22nd, where the question was, does the Ukraine emergency and the possibility of Western economic sanctions, does that justify uh, a basic change in the Russian economic policy? And Medvedev, this is actually Medvedev to the Duma before the before the evening meeting, the data says to the Duma, look, um, essentially neoliberal economics are untouchable. We have to stay with them and we never change. Quote from, from Medvedev, I do not believe it is correct to change Russian economic policy, in effect, in any fundamental way. It would also be incorrect to start the flip-flop, trying to think up some new principles of development for our economy, such as businessism, protectionism, uh, mercantilism, the ones that succeed. Russia, of course, may have its own pathway with regard to national consciousness and values, but the laws of economics remain universal. This means the neoliberal Manchester school, in effect, like Ricardo and Mill and all these bums. The laws of economics remain universal, and in the face of this unprecedented challenge, it is extremely important for us to calmly, without hysteria, continue the economic strategy we have chosen. And the answer to that was crickets. Crickets. So in other words, Medvedev is out of step and out of touch. And I think that goes for Sinwanov and Kudrin and Gref. So the Glaziev policy is the one that's needed. And um, obviously this goes right to the heart of the principle weakness and vulnerability of the Putin, uh, the governing solution that he represents, under conditions of imperialist attack in Ukraine and with these sanctions being imposed, I think this is now a concrete possibility that Russia will have to break out of the system in the way that Kalaziev has outlined. And I hope they do. I think that would be the best thing for humanity and, uh, this would essentially complete the uh, the restarting of history. In other words, if you, if you want to function on all cylinders, you got to end this whole economic liberalization thing. Now, what might cause this to happen? Well, obviously Ukraine, right? Ukraine has had a fake election. I was on press TV uh, about a week ago before that vote. Um, I guess on the eve of the vote, and remember that candidates for the uh, presidency of Ukraine were beaten, forced to stop being candidates. The same thing goes for members of the infamous Ukrainian Rada. They were beaten, forced to flee. What you've got calling itself the Rada is a rump Rada with a, a couple of hundred deputies in effect that have been purged. This is pretty much what Hitler did in early 1933 when he forced the communists uh, out of the Reichstag, right, arrested some of them, intimidated others, made others flee, uh, and then got himself uh, voted these uh, sweeping emergency powers. Right? That's a Mexicans Gazette, as it's known in historical writing. So uh, you also have killing going on, right? The Odessa massacre, was it 50 dead, 100 dead, 150 dead, killed by gunmen, in constant fighting, and so forth. So this is an absolute mockery of the election. So you won't listen to my views on that in depth. That's at Tarpley.net, and that's the, uh, the press TV uh, appearance. But now we have Poroshenko. All right, who is Poroshenko? An oligarch, the chocolate king, Willy Wonka. But somebody who finances fascism, that's his specialty. He's eggs of Maidan. So when you see Yarosh... And at that point, uh, Muzichka, the fascist leader, how could they camp out there? Because they're all getting $25 a day base pay and then from 
up from there from Poroshenko. He used his television station and his money bags to make this whole Maidan fascist carnival and fascist festival what it was, right? Media event. So um, this is not a Democratic uh, candidate, right? He He's essentially the one who funded the goons and the thugs and the street fighters and the Stormop dialogue that then, then did their work. Now, what does he do? He he says, now, I'm the president. I have a mandate. And a mandate for what? For reconciliation? For social peace? No, he says, my mandate, in effect, is to to pull out all the stops. In other words, to send the Ukrainian forces on a killing spree and finally crush uh, all manifestations of uh, dissent and resistance in in eastern Ukraine, and that's pretty much what he was uh, what he was doing. So um, that started uh, on on the Monday after the Sunday, right? One twenty four hours. This guy was allegedly in office, and then the, the killing starts in grand style. Now, in the midst of that killing, we also point out that the Ukraine army is doing badly. They're getting uh, helicopters shot down. Their casualties, they, there was one day where they managed to hit a truck loaded with uh, pro-Russian anti-fascist forces and killed 30 or 40 of them. But generally speaking, the, the casualties of the Ukraine army are uh, not negligible. And the Ukraine army, most of them have much less reason to fight. Uh, they're not fighting for their lives. They're simply fighting for this this Kiev fascist clique with Poroshenko now being there instead of Turchinov. Um it's 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 also the case that the uh the the only people really that fight on the Ukrainian side of the or the, the most of them are the uh, the right sector thugs and goons, right of Yarosh and so forth. This this problem that we see that the Russian forces are not unified, right, that there was some kind of a standoff between two groups of anti Kiev pro Russian Forces. Well, that's uh, what you get under these uh, tremendously chaotic circumstances. Right? Maybe the remedy for that is for Russia to come in and restore order, precisely. And we'll be back in just a minute on World Crisis Radio. So, uh, May 30th here in uh, New York City. It's about 1:30 uh, in the afternoon, and I'm here because of the Left Forum, and I was just going through some of the. Uh, some of the points that compared to uh, last year that I think are important uh, this year. The other thing I, I would like to stress, <laughs> Fukuyama says the end of history is a very sad time. So if that's your experience of the last 25 years or so, take heart. There may be new hope now. Things The world is going to look different now. Uh, this unipolar thing has been very bad. Again, it brought out the worst in the United States. Neocons, warmongers, reactionaries have thrived. Parasitism has increased. Unemployment, the degradation of the workforce, uh, union busting, lowering of the standard of living, cultural barbarism, racism, all the, the neocon Republican sorts of themes. Right? We've got libertarian racists and white supremacists running around. So um, things are going to change now. Uh, ruling class is insane. And here's